Something as spiritual as courtly Platonic love could not long be kept out of religion, and soon the monks and priests of the Catholic Church found a way to express it in their faith. Indeed, it was already there. Since biblical times, Mary was believed to be the mother of God. This gave her a quasi-divine status with Christian believers, who were praying to her by the third or fourth century. According to Roman Catholic dogma, Mary was the recipient of the Immaculate Conception, which means that she was conceived without sin in her mother's womb. Though the mother of Jesus, she remained a virgin. At the end of her life, she was taken up into heaven in a process called the Assumption. In heaven, she hears our prayers and intercedes with Christ on our behalf. As an ideal of womanhood, the Blessed Virgin Mary fit the model for a religious version of courtly love. By the High Middle Ages, her image was venerated throughout Christendom, and hundreds of churches took the name Notre Dame, or Our Lady. Soon men of religion were dedicating themselves to Mary with similar words and emotions to that of a knight to his lady. Olido, bishop of the Cluny Monastery, said, O oh, most loving virgin, mother of the Savior of all ages, from this day onward take me into your service. Except for God, I place nothing above you, and as your own very servant. I freely place myself under your command forever. Mary was hailed as Fair Lady of the Knights and venerated as the Queen of Heaven. While the south of France led the cultural rebirth in the 1100s, things were afoot in Paris that would both strengthen the French monarchy and move the center of Western culture to this far northern outpost. Paris dated back to Roman times. The Parisi were Celtic tribesmen who built a settlement around 250 BC on an island in the Seine River, now called the Ile de la Cité. The Romans conquered the area in 52 BC and greatly expanded the settlement to include a forum, palaces, baths, temples, theaters, and an amphitheater. When the Romans collapsed, the city came under the control of the Franks, a pagan German tribe, and the city went into a long decline. Clovis, the first Christian king of France, made it his capital in 508, but in the later 700s, the Carolingians moved the capital to Aachen, now in Germany, leaving Paris to be raided over and over again by the Vikings. Finally, in 987, a Parisian count named Hugh Capet managed to get himself elected to the French throne and made Paris once again the capital. This important event is often seen as the beginning of the modern French nation. I'm standing atop the Montmartre Hill in northern Paris. It's right around here that Saint-Denis, the legendary Bishop of Paris, was executed around 250 AD. According to the legend, he came here from Rome to convert the pagan Parisi, and he did such a good job of making converts that the pagan priests had him arrested, tried, and beheaded. But he wasn't quite dead yet. He picked up his head, and he walked for 10 kilometers, preaching a sermon the entire way. Finally, he expired at the bottom of the hill and died at the spot where he wanted to be buried. The Christians of Paris attended to his wish and followed up by building the Basilica of Saint-Denis on the very spot. The church quickly became an important pilgrimage spot for French Christians, and nearly every French monarch from Hugh Capet on was buried in the church's crypt. 
In the 1100s, a massive remodel of the church was undertaken by a man named Suger, the abbot of San Dini Monastery from 1123 to 1151. Suger was a close friend and confidant of the French kings of his day and encouraged them to strengthen their armies and impose their will on the French countryside. It was Suger's idea for Louis VII to marry Eleanor of Aquitaine and thus acquire the south of France. And the old man was furious when Louis divorced her and lost the south country again. In the 1130s, Suger took it into his head to remodel the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis into a grand monumental cathedral, fitting for the burial place of saints and kings. Suger was enamored with the writings of one Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, a 6th century philosopher who blended pagan philosophy with Christianity and took the pseudonym Dionysius claiming to be the Athenian convert of Paul the Apostle, mentioned in Acts 17.34. If this wasn't confusing enough, Suger was under the impression that the real author of Dionysius' writings was Saint Denis himself. He wasn't, but Suger nevertheless dug his philosophy, especially passages like the one that is today posted in Saint Denis' crypt. For whosoever exercises his powers of reflection, manifestations of beauty become the figures of an invisible harmony. Dionysius and Suger believed that beautiful things were signs from God that led humans toward a communion with deity. This stone or that piece of wood, Dionysius wrote, is a light to me because all visible things are material lights reflecting the infinite light of God. For Suger, this was a justification for his love of ornamentation and richness for beautifully worked metal and stone and glass. Suger worked closely with his architects to create a space that captured the grand counterpoint between earth and heaven. His cathedral would be made of stone yet it would aspire to the heavens. Both the entrance and the area around the altar were completed under Suger's watchful eye. Here we see the Gothic arch used consistently for the first time to create a dizzying ribbed vault. All round the altar is a string of chapels, which in Suger's words, shine with the wonderful and uninterrupted light of most luminous windows pervading the interior beauty. Here in Saint-Denis, Suger purposefully set out to create an architectural form that illustrated the scholastic philosophy of his time, that God is the source of all truth, goodness, and beauty, and that the Holy Spirit illuminates the human mind in the same way that the light of the sun illuminates the day.